So let's do a wrap up about heart failure. Heart failure is going to be a disease process that you're going to see a lot of. And it's very important that you understand how to treat it um, and what you're going to be concerned about as the nurse. So let's start by talking about what the problem is in heart failure. And the problem, first problem is, is that the heart can't move blood forward. Um, and so heart failure is a pump problem. Heart failure is a problem of the heart muscle where it loses its ability to squeeze and move blood forward. There's lots of reasons it can happen. We're not going to go into that, but effectively it all comes down to that heart muscle becoming weak, becoming unable to move blood forward. So what happens? Blood backs up. Blood backs up and forms kind of like, you know, I always make the joke of it's a, um, you know, like you're on the highway and it forms, you know, like that long line of cars. That's what your blood is like in heart failure. It is um, backing up into other areas because it has nowhere else to go because it doesn't have a strong enough pump to squeeze it forward. So what does the heart try to do after that? Well, the heart tries to compensate. It activates your sympathetic nervous system. It activates your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Uh, to try to help and your heart really thinks it's helping it has good intentions because your heart all your heart sees um, Is that you're not getting enough cardiac output because remember let's let's go back the heart can't move blood forward So what happens if you're not moving blood forward? You're not getting enough Blood out you're not getting enough oxygen out. You're not getting enough nutrients out to feed the rest of your tissues so again, your heart then is like, okay, well, hey, that's not working. I need more blood. I need to get more oxygen out to my tissues. So what does it do? It says, hey, I'm going to activate my body sympathetic nervous system. What's that? That's that fight or flight. That's that a bear is chasing me. Um, you know, it's that activation of that, you know, I'm in trouble system. And so what does it do? It, it increases your blood pressure, increases your heart rate by constricting the blood vessels, um, trying to get the heart to squeeze harder. So it really is trying to help. But when you already have a sick and a weak heart, this just makes things worse. Um, so that's the first thing your heart tries to do. The other thing is your kidneys. Your kidneys are a very, very selfish organ. They're also very, very whiny. If they don't get the perfusion in the blood they want, they say, fine, if you're not going to give me blood, I'm going to um, activate my friend RAS or the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And effectively what happens in the RAS is that you secrete, a, it's like a sequence or a cascade of um, these um, things that are released, angiotensin 1, angiotensin 2, aldosterone, and all these things, hormones and others, um, that cause you to Hold on to more fluid, hold on to more sodium, because remember, sodium follows water. And then also, it causes like a vasoconstriction, again, that clamping down. So, as a whole, it's your kidneys trying to get you to have more blood pressure. And your kidneys, again, they had good intentions. They're just trying to help. So, first, your heart is like, I'm not getting enough blood out, so I'm going to squeeze harder. I'm going to... Um, clamp down on my blood vessels and make them narrow so that I can have more pressure. Then the kidneys get involved. They're sitting there trying to help by, again, holding on to more water, holding on to more salt, squeezing those blood vessels. But what is all this doing? It's just making things worse. So over and over again, your heart's doing this and it keeps doing it more. It'll work for a little bit, but then your heart's getting tired that your heart muscle gets bigger. It gets what we call remodeled. It gets thicker. Thicker isn't better. Trust me. Uh, we call the heart as thick as it can be is not as effective. There's less room to fill in the heart. No matter how thick your heart is, if it can't squeeze, if it can't fill with blood, it's no good. So the heart tries to um, get bigger. Um, all these compensation mechanisms just make things so much worse and it still ends up where your heart is even worse off it's even weaker than it's ever been and you still cannot get blood to move forward so now that we've established what the problem is let's talk about what this patient's going to look like most patients that you're going to see are going to have left-sided heart failure um, that's because the left side is your biggest pump. It has to work the hardest, so it's also the most likely to get weak and have trouble moving blood forward. 
So if you have a left-sided heart failure, we are really worried about the lungs because left equals lungs. That's a good way to remember it. So we established that the problem is, is that the heart cannot move blood forward. There's something about the pump, the muscle of your heart that can't move it forward. So what happens to that blood? Well, it has nowhere to go. It backs up. Consider it the worst traffic jam of your life. Like when you're driving up to traffic and you see this long line of cars, that's what heart failure is. But they have nowhere to go. So where does it back up to? Well, if the blood can't move out of the left ventricle, it backs up into the left atrium. And if it backs up past then, where does it go? It goes to the lungs because that's where the only place it can go. So what does this patient look like? They have lung symptoms. So they're going to have signs of shortness of breath. They're going to have difficulty lying down flat, a lot of trouble getting up and moving around and breathing, maybe a cough, really wet lung sounds because... Fluid has backed up into their lungs. They may be coughing, have an increased respiratory rate. They can even have signs that they're getting poor perfusion or oxygen to their tissues because their lungs are so full of fluid. Additionally, because they're not getting oxygen out, the heart can compensate again and have that increased heart rate. Um, they can also have confusion, and this might be confusing to you, but think of it this way. If the heart can't get blood forward, where does the left ventricle pump blood to? It pumps blood to the rest of the heart. And if the left ventricle, the left side of the heart, your powerhouse isn't working, you're not getting blood out to all of your organs, including your brain. And if your brain's not getting perfusion, not getting oxygen, you have a good chance of being confused. So let's now talk about the right side. So most people are going to have left-sided heart failure. Um, most people are going to have left-sided or both. Um, most people don't have right-sided by itself. A lot of times left-sided causes right-sided because remember, going back and thinking about this, if the left side is backing up, it's backing up into the lungs. That means that there's a lot of pressure in the lungs, a lot of pressure that the right side of the heart, that right-sided heart muscle has to fight against to pump blood forward. So usually they'll start with left-sided heart failure, but as that pressure builds up in the lungs and the right side of the heart has to work harder to pump blood forward, the right side of the heart tends to fail after the left side. So when you think of right-sided heart failure, when you think of the rest of the body, so R's, so right equals the rest of the body. So th this person, let's see where their traffic jam is going. So if a, they have a right-sided problem, where does it go? If it can't go forward from the right ventricle, it goes back into the right atrium. And then if it backs up from there, where does it have to go? Well, the only place it has to go is the rest of the body. So this is a backup into the rest of the, um, the blood uh, vessels in your body. So that means you're going to have JVD, which is jugular venous distension, you know, the backup into the neck of all that extra fluid. You can have GI symptoms, ascites, enlarged organs in your stomach because all that blood is backing up um, into your abdominal space. Um, general weight gain, dependent edema. So, you know, you'll see a lot of edema in their legs as well. Uh, and a lot of fatigue. They're just full of fluid in the rest of their body because it has nowhere else to go. The traffic jam has backed up into the rest of the body. So what diagnostic testing do we do more specifically for heart failure? So one lab we might want to look at is what's called a BNP or a brain natriuretic peptide. And this is a measure of the amount of stretch in the heart. So why do we care about the amount of stretch? Because the amount of stretch is the amount of volume that's in the heart. And so we're really, this is giving us an idea of the volume uh, that is on the heart, how much it's stretched from that extra volume because the heart can't move blood forward. Um, so a normal BMP is going to be less than 100. Another thing we might consider is a chest x-ray. And as you can see in this chest x-ray, that there is a very large heart here. Um, and so why does that matter? Well, one, it's telling us we can see that there's something not right with the heart. The heart has gotten super thick in order to try to compensate for not being able to pump blood out. It thinks if it gets thicker, it will be stronger to be able to pump blood out. But this doesn't help. Um, and we also see how it can affect the lungs. And not only do the lungs, you can see there's all that congestion in there, but look at what the heart's doing to the lungs. It's taking up all the space of that left lung. That lung's not going to be able to expand the same way, which is going to cause a lot of breathing problems. So this can kind of let us know, you know, what might be going on with the patient. 
Additionally, we might want to check an echocardiogram. An echo is going to let us visualize the heart and see how well it's functioning. Look at that muscle function that is not working. See how well the heart is able to squeeze and contract and see how much it can, uh, blood it can get out of the heart. That's really going to help us to stage and see where this person is in their heart failure. How much blood are they able to get out and get perfusion to their tissues? So now that we've established uh, what heart failure is, what it looks like, and how we'll diagnose it, let's talk about how we're going to treat it. We have three main goals with heart failure. We're really trying to decrease the symptoms, you know, and try to make this patient more comfortable because this is a chronic illness. There's no cure for it. We also want to slow down that compensation or stop that compensation. Your heart and your kidneys are trying to help. They're just making things worse. We want to kind of reverse that. And then we also want to prevent complications, of course. And our overall, you know, overarching goal is that we want to decrease the workload of the heart. We don't want the heart working so hard. We want to decrease its oxygen needs. We want to decrease um, how hard it is straining itself, I mean, you know, to prolong their life and decrease their symptoms. So what medications can help with that? First, there's diuretics. And how are diuretics going to help? Well, diuretics are going to help because they're going to decrease that workload of the heart because they're going to decrease that volume. The heart's not going to have to work so hard to pump blood forward since there's not going to be as much volume that it's you know kind of drowning in. But also think about if we get some fluid off the lungs, that person's going to be able to breathe more easily and they're going to be able to um, not have as much oxygen needs because their lungs are not going to be filled with fluids. So they're going to breathe a little bit better. So not only do diuretics help with comfort, you know, just the daily living, um, but they're also going to help decrease that extra strain on the heart with all that fluid. I'm going to skip down to positive inotropes. So positive inotropes help because what's the problem in heart failure? The heart is not squeezing. It's not able to move blood forward. So positive inotropes improve contractility. They improve that heart squeeze so you can get blood out so that you have more oxygen to your tissues and also so that your heart doesn't have to work so hard. It kind of takes off some of that um, workload of the heart. Um, so these two drugs in the middle, you'll see ACEs and ARBs and beta blockers, they're both starred. And because both of these are going to help significantly decrease the morbidity and mortality that's, uh, that heart failure has. And it's doing this by blocking the compensation. So we established in the beginning that you know, the problem is, is that the heart's not working. It's not pumping blood forward. And then things get even worse because then the heart and the rest of the body try to compensate. So um, the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, the RAS gets activated. So we need to block these systems because they're just making things worse. They're making it harder on the heart. They're demanding more oxygen from the heart and making the heart have to work double time um, over and over and over again. And we really want to slow down that process. So first we want to block the sympathetic nervous system. So we can do that by giving beta blockers. Beta blockers are going to decrease your heart rate so that you have time to fill. It's also going to decrease that constriction of your blood vessels so that your heart doesn't have to work so hard to pump against those really narrow vessels. Um, and then there's also ACEs and ARBs, and they're going to kind of block that damage that the, um, you know, the kidneys are um, stimulating the RAS to be activated. And ACEs and ARBs are going to help to decrease that um, fluid accumulation, decrease that sodium retention, decrease that resistance, that, um, uh, that constriction of the blood vessels that um, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system is doing. So effectively, both of these are going to help to decrease that extra resistance that's in the blood vessels, decrease that um, extra work that the heart has to do to pump against those narrow vessels. Um, and then ACEs and ARBs are also going to decrease some of that fluid load so you're not holding on to so much fluid so that the heart doesn't have to work so hard. So as a whole, what else can we do? So I mentioned there's no cure. We just try to manage the symptoms as best as possible and get this patient to a place where they can, um, you know, more comfortably live and try to decrease some of that extra workload of the heart. So they definitely need to be compliant with their meds and get a lot of good education. So one of the best th uh, things that we could teach them is daily weights. So these patients, they can't barely see their legs or their feet sometimes or reach for them. We don't want them working too hard. So how are they going to know if they're retaining extra fluid once they go home? 
daily weight. This means weighing themselves in the same time, in the same clothes, the same way, in the same scale every single day. And that if they see big changes in their weight, that's something they're going to need to report to their physician. It's a great way to kind of tell their fluid balance on a day-to-day -day basis. Additionally, we want to educate them on a diet, a low-sodium diet, a cardiac diet, um, to help decrease some of those extra risk factors, maybe help them lose some weight, which can help to decrease that workload of their heart. A lot of these patients are going to be on a fluid restriction, usually about a liter and a half or two liter per day fluid restriction, because remember, they're not moving fluid forward. They do not have low volume. They just don't. They have a pump problem. They can't get that volume they do have moved in the right direction, moved to the right places. Um, we also want to reduce other heart stressors, so teach them energy conservation. We don't want them doing all their activities at once. They want them um, to space their activities throughout the day and be able to take breaks and rest um, and fix other problems. So if they have any sort of blockages in their coronary arteries, something stressing their body, infection, anything that's going on in their body, we don't want their body stressed because the body stress is going to stress the heart and make it that much harder. Um, also, just general health maintenance, seeing their physician, getting their vaccines, all of these things are going to help. Um, so as a whole, we really just want to support this patient, help them to decrease those uncomfortable symptoms, get that fluid off, um, have their heart stop having to work so hard and fight against the rest of the body. So um, this is heart failure in a basket. I hope it helped. Thank you for listening.